that I should introduce to her tonight. Here comes Georgia. Give her a warm applause. You know, this is always the hardest part, like hoping that the laptop like works. It looks like it does. Okay, cool. So that's the hard part down. <coughs> All right, yeah, I'm Georgia, and uh, I just want to start with, I came to the event last night, you know, the reception, and I was kind of astounded by it, really. Um, you know, I, I'm not really from this world, per se, you know, more the traditional pen testing world, as, you know, was mentioned, you know, more, you know, the, the DEF CONs of the world is more, you know, where I came up, if you will, and then, you know, then I decided I was going to be an entrepreneur, so now I hang out with venture capitalists at, at business cons, which is, you know, a whole, whole nother thing, but, you know, of those two worlds, and not to knock either of them, I love them very much, yada, yada, but, you know, at receptions, I don't think I'd ever been to a reception where everybody just seemed so passionate about, you know, the community they were in, the work they were doing. I mean, people were getting out laptops and, like, showing each other their work and talking about projects and talking about, you know, stuff that, one, was way over my head, but I realized a lot of it was because they were using acronyms I didn't understand. I actually knew what was going on, I just didn't understand the acronyms. Um, but just the amount of passion that I saw from you guys, it was just astounding, and I was really glad to see that. You know, maybe it gave me a certain amount of hope back that I had lost being, you know, an entrepreneur and, you know, having to talk to venture capitalists about, like, you know, the return on investment of things. Um, so definitely keep doing what you're doing. I used to do open source, um, but then people made fun of me all the time. You know, I told people this last night and realized how much of a coward I am because I did... Um, something called the smartphone pen test framework, which was you know, the beginning of what's now you know my platform of products that I do you know at my company, um, and it was DARPA funded. So basically, the U.S. government gave me money to do it, and uh, you know I went to you know my my job where I worked, and I said, hey, I got this like DARPA contract to do like research for the community and like present it at Black Hat and stuff, and they basically said, you can either do that or you can leave. Um, so, you know, that was, I guess, the sword in my back about open source is that, you know, my choices were either, you know, be part of the open source community and starve or, you know, have a job. Um, but in talking to a lot of you, I guess, maybe the world has become more progressive and I'm getting old that, you know, a number of you are able to, like, hold jobs, you know, and do, you know, InfoSec by day and get paid and still you know, be involved in this community, still contribute to open source projects, and that's awesome. Um, you know, I wish I had had that opportunity, but like I said, they, they threw me out on the street if I was going to do that. But anyway, then, you know, my open source product came out and then people were like, wow, Georgia codes like um, a cat who threw up spaghetti, and there, there was actually a meme. You can find it. Um, so that's why I don't do open source anymore. That and you know the venture capitalists apparently all hate it. Um, but I realized that was kind of cowardly. So I'm totally going to go back to doing open source stuff because of you guys. So for all the cat throw up spaghetti code in the world, you have only yourselves to thank. Um, I also wrote this book penetration testing. I'm working on the second edition right now. This is actually supposed to be, I always bring like ones to give away, uh, but I guess I forgot. Um, this is supposed to be like my revision copy um, for working on the second edition, um, but let's not kid ourselves here. Um, the likelihood that I'm actually going to use it on this trip is pretty small. Um, so this is, if you don't mind the fact that it's been around the world and has coffee stains on it, um, I do have one to give away. I always do a trivia question. I realize my trivia question that I usually use is probably not the right one for this audience, so I actually, I'm gonna use my notes because I just learned this, this acronym last night. Um, but, so, you know, first hand raised, whatever, or, you know, just bum rush the stage for all I care. Uh, whatever you guys are into. Um, so, um, can anyone tell me what a jot is? Okay, I heard it somewhere in the back. Whoever said JSON Web Token, you get the coffee stained book. It is signed. Again, there is a new edition coming out, um, but you know that one's still good. 
and it's free. All right, so let's like actually talk about stuff now. Um, so I, I also kind of freaked out last night because you know, in talking to a lot of you guys, I realized, wow, this is not an infosec conference per se. This is like a developer conference, and yeah, I do. I break things more than I build them. Though now that I build products, I also you know build things as well. Um, but you know, this talk is really more about um, mobility and Internet of Things because you know that's my area. But I have had to put a web interface onto a product myself, and I've had to do it securely. So I know a little bit about what you guys do. Um, but you know, the name of my talk has always been, you know, the perimeter has been shattered um, because the idea being that you know we in in the defensive side of security, you know, the other side of what I do, being a pen tester. You know, we're putting a lot of our money and a lot of our time and a lot of our resources into defending the perimeter, defending, you know, the ins and the outs of our, you know, intranet, if you will, you know, our firewalls, our intrusion detections, things like that. Most of that is at the perimeter, you know, with the idea that traffic must go in and out. So, you know, if there's an attack, it must come in. If it wants to talk back to its command and control, it must, you know, come back out. Um, but naturally, as we will see, that is not necessarily the case anymore um, with all these, you know, bring your own devices and, and smart coffee pots and things like that um, that speak things besides just Wi-Fi or, you know, traditional wired connection that they may be bypassing the perimeter. But I also found out that you guys have actually been saying the perimeter has been shattered a lot longer than I have because you've been saying the web applications are the perimeter, not the firewall. So maybe I am going to make sense after all. So we'll see. Um, I've become a business person. I now do overview slides. These are the things we're going to talk about. But instead of actually like talking about what we're going to talk about, why don't we just talk about it? Um, you may or may not have ever seen one of these if you were like in the defensive side of, if that was your job, it's like to defend an enterprise. You probably have one of these on your wall um, or something like it. Since it's all blue boxes, I assume my ex-CEO stole this from Cisco at some point, um, since they always use blue boxes. Uh, but this is the traditional idea of what an enterprise is and what we as you know, the people who are defending the enterprise have to deal with. And it's, it's flat, for starters, though, uh, 3D pictures, you know. You might have multiple sites. It might, it's probably a lot more complicated than this, but ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, this is kind of how we think about it. You know, we have these devices, and you know, they sit in our offices somewhere, and we probably image to them ourselves. We have the domain admin password for them. We probably have some sort of like endpoint threat agent or antivirus or something on them that we control. You know, either as the IT department or the security department. You know, depending, um, and you know, we control all of it, and. Most importantly, we control you know, the egress and the ingress of the traffic. You know, if something bad is going on, we're monitoring it, and we're able to see it you know, again at that perimeter with you know, all our nice next generation firewalls and intrusion detections and things. We're able to see all of those attacks when somebody gets fished and things like that. We're able to see it, everything's good. Yeah, if only, right? If only we had solved all of those old problems. Um, and everything was grand, but yet, you know, people still keep getting fished. Side note about that, right? Okay, so fishing, right? I, I'm the dumbest person in my family, like absolutely the dumbest. And I know it's like really cliche to like, you know, use your mom as an example. But my mom has a PhD in computer science. We're talking about a really actually very, very intelligent individual about technology even. And my dad is a physicist. Again, a very technical individual, super smart. Like, you could ask him, like, any integral in the world, like, you know, math stuff, and he can just, like, do it in his head. Not like, you know, what's 9 plus 9, but, like, you know, what's the integral of, like, some crazy, like, thermodynamic stuff. Really, really smart people. But yet, continually, I get the stuff like, it said the, the website said that like, the Flash player was out of date, and I've always been told I need to update. So I clicked update, and now my computer is basically destroyed. Naturally, you know, they clicked on something that installed malware on their computer. And it's like, if really super smart people can't get it, especially when they have to occasionally listen to me talk and they both have copies of my book, like, what hope is there? Like, you know, we kind of, I think, as an industry, 
And again, you know, I may be in the wrong industry, but I, I assure you, surely secure developers are the same way. You know, when you talk about, you know, other developers, you're probably thinking in the same kind of paradigm. It's like, how dumb can these people be that they can't get it, that they don't need to put SQL injection in their code? But it's just like, you know, if these really smart people are still making these mistakes, you know, this is just what we're going to have to put up with, I've realized, that it's like, you know, we're never going to be able to stop people from making what seems to us like a bad decision. But from everything they've been taught, they're supposed to install updates, right? So naturally, in our traditional paradigm, what do we do? We make it so that they can't install anything. We make it so they are not local admin on their machines. So if they click on it, it doesn't work. And it's all well and good because we've secured our enterprise. But then the iPhone came out, I guess you could say. And the CEO came to work after Christmas with his iPhone and said, I would like to put this on the network today. And that's where all the trouble started. So this is more of the reality of your current enterprise. So you've got, I, you know, I talk about mobile and IoT, Internet of Things mainly, um, but cloud really, I think, kind of falls into the same category of its, you know, it's stuff that we don't control, that we have to deal with, you know, as security people. It's, you know, in our enterprise, you know, a small company like me, you know, I use Google Apps for my mail. Please don't start attacking my stuff. I don't know if you guys are the type to do that, but. You know, I'd rather you didn't, you know, take down all my websites while I was on stage. I'm sure you could, believe me. But uh, don't, if you don't mind. But, you know, salesforce.com, LinkedIn, other social medias. I mean, these are things that, you know, you probably use. You know, you might use Slack for, you know, communication or some other, you know, instant messenger. I mean, these are cloud-based things that have, you know, their own security stuff that you have to deal with. What if they don't patch their stuff? What if they're storing all your credentials in plain text and your users are using the same credentials for, say, Slack or Salesforce that they are for like their enterprise login? Now what? Again, it's, it's stuff we can't control as security people that we have to deal with. So, you know, I put, you know, the cloud and software as a service kind of in the same category, even though really I'm talking about mobile. You know, it's also, you know, the fact that people are much more Dare I say it, mobile now. I mean, people go to conference. I mean, how many of you brought, you know, some sort of work-related device with you, you know, be it a mobile phone or, or a laptop or something? I mean, I'm going to try and get work done here. I know I did. You know, when I went to China, I took different stuff. I didn't take my work to China because, you know, I did take some devices so I could get some malware samples. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, most places I take my work with me. I'm sure my customers really appreciate that um, when I turn in work. Um, but we go to different places, you know, like I said, in China, you know, the, 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 some places you go, the infrastructure itself might attack you. I don't know about you guys' conferences, but some of the conferences I go to, the infrastructure will attack you. Um, so, you know, you open yourself up to that risk. You're going to client sites, you're getting on airplanes. Who knows, you know, who's on the airplane Wi-Fi with you. Um, this is actually a funny one I've seen, you know, with rental cars. You know, most of the rental cars are newer. They've got, like, the ability to, like, sync your phone. You know, you want to play your iTunes through the, the car radio. My car is too old to do that. So naturally, whenever I get a rental car, I'm rocking it out. But, you know, you also have the ability to, like, sync all your other stuff, like contacts and whatnot. And several times, actually, when I've gotten in a rental car, it's actually had, like, the last person's stuff still sync to it, so, which is, you know, a great entree for fishing, right? It's like, oh, look at all these business contacts. Awesome. Um, so, I mean, we're connecting. And naturally, also, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen, like, you know, the Wired articles about, you know, the, the cars really just being phones with a, a car around them. And they talk to cell towers, and they can be hacked as well. Um, but we've got, you know, all these different devices. You know, people go to the coffee shop and work. You know, you guys go to the pub. You know, you do your work while you drink, right? Um, so, you know, you've got the infrastructure there. Everywhere the devices are going, they're potentially, you know, in a hostile environment that, again, we don't control. It takes us out of that blue box scenario from the last slide where we controlled everything to this device comes to work on Monday and who knows what has happened to it. Whatever its security posture was when it left on Friday, we can no longer make any assumptions of the same um, when it comes back. So the threat model around mobile is really 
similar to the same sorts of threat models we've been dealing with. I mean, we've got you know the occasional remote attack, you know, where things like Eternal Blue and Eternal Romance, and you know, a bit older MSO8067 things where you know it nobody has to do anything. Just the fact that it's unpatched, you know, puts you in a situation where you know there's no user involvement at all. You know, occasionally we see that you know in the mobile world as well. You know, the chipsets are getting hit. Like there was an attack called Blueborn, um, where it was actually the Bluetooth chipset. Um, was vulnerable. Naturally, you had to be somewhat close to people, but I could, you know, blue, blue born you all right now, I guess, if you were vulnerable. Um, but they've been patched. Um, certainly, um, client side attacks are alive and well. You know, applications, you know, what you guys are into, right? Application development, people writing insecure applications um, with the same sorts of vulnerabilities, you know, you're used to in, in web. Um, additionally, you've got you know, the users installing malicious applications, but again, we've, we've dealt with that with our traditional machines as well. You know, like I said, my, my mother installing Flash, I think, oh, she's gonna hate me if she sees this talk. Hopefully she's gotten to the point where she doesn't watch everything I do anymore. Um, certainly, phishing, we'll talk a bit more about phishing a little later on. Um, all the different ways they communicate, um, as I said, you know, the real problem with the perimeter being shattered is, you know, if we're looking at the perimeter, if our firewall is watching the wired and wireless connections, and you've got attacks coming in, say, through Bluetooth or through near field communication or through the cellular modem, because there's a malicious cell tower or something like that, um, you're not going to be able to see it, which is unfortunate. Um, so, you know, the threat model is very much the same as what we've traditionally dealt with, but a little more complex because there's you know all these new ways of communicating you know the as we'll see and I guess I think the next slide um, you know the different kind of like security architecture behind the thing and you know the biggest thing being that you know we can't just take away people's administrative access to the thing and say you can't install stuff well I mean you kind of can but not really I mean in general you know with this bring your own device thing the user can kind of do what they want and we as security have to deal with it. And I never thought I would hear myself say this, but, well, I've said it a couple times now. The real problem with a lot of these devices is they're just a little too secure, which just sounds wrong. But, you know, when the iPhone 1 came out, everything ran as root, like everything. The first iPhone jailbreak was, it was a browser exploit. The browser ran as root, so that was it, you know, real bad on the security side. Um, certainly, they've gotten a lot better since then. You know, iOS is is one of the hardest ones to, if not the hardest, you know, platform out there to you know get complete you know control over it. You know, turn off code signing and you know do whatever you want on, and thus you know bug bounties for it are very high. Android also, you know, Android always gets a bad rap. You know, iOS and Android are like the big two operating systems. You know, there's a lot of IoT stuff that runs on Android um, as well. Um, but you know, Android's really you know stepped it up a lot. I, it always gets a bad rap, but you know it's got SE Linux. It's got all that you know good stuff going. Actually, these days I would actually say that I would, and I do you know often you know with my clients have to do like you know they have an Android and iOS sh shop, so you know I have to you know throw exploits at both of them. And I actually like doing iOS better. Yes, it's it's slightly harder, but. Um, Android is so fragmented that getting you know exploits that'll work against like everybody in the enterprise is a lot harder to do than you know once you've got it on the iPhone for you know a certain like one you're good. So I actually like hitting iPhone better now, which I know makes me sound crazy. Um, but anyway, the the point being that you know these things are designed now with security in mind at like every layer, like all the way from the hardware root of trust, all the way up to you know the application layer. The, the entire device built with you know, security in mind, which, which is great. I'm glad to see developers doing that, and I'm sure you are as well. But as defenders, as people who have to you know, secure the enterprise, this has actually created a terrible disaster. And this is why. I, I use this example of antivirus. Everybody you know, basically kicks antivirus and says it sucks. You know, they make a, a ton of money, so from a business sense, antivirus is great. But here's the thing, antivirus, you know, as an industry, what they do pretty well is find like 
the kind of stuff my mom installs, you know? She, her antivirus does indeed pop up when she does that. It finds these known samples. It scans, you know, files and looks for like hatches. There's a chapter in the book on bypassing antivirus. It's not hard. Your, you know, advanced persistent threat is not going to get found by antivirus. I assure you. If all you're doing in your enterprise is using antivirus, you're you're not doing enough. Um, but you know, antivirus does do that. You know, on like a traditional Windows workstation, pretty well. You know, somebody clicks on something stupid, it pops up. And you know it may even help you clean it up. At the very least, it sends an alert back, and you know the IT department or the security department can deal with it. On these devices, it naturally, being business people as they were, mobile, they just put the word mobile in front of it. In a lot of cases, you know every antivirus vendor has a mobile product. You know a whole new uh, enterprises came up um, just doing. Um, mobile antivirus, and you know we'll talk more about the defensive side of things. Um, but you know, in, a, in the worst case for this, basically the antivirus application sitting at the application layer with no administrative privileges that the user installed, all it can do is scan itself to see whether it is a virus, and then go back to sleep for a certain amount of time, and then do this again. Because the way the platform is built, the sandbox to keep apps from hurting each other makes it so that. You can't actually scan any of the other ones, so it's basically useless. But people are still paying $9.95 per device for it, so everything's well and good, right, on the vendor side. But the, by making things more secure, we've ultimately made things hard for ourselves because we're used to doing things with like antivirus, and now that doesn't work anymore. What on earth are we gonna do? Maybe retrofitting our old security maybe wasn't the best idea. I talked a little bit about the input output. That's really the, I think, crux of the issue. Well, that and what I just talked about um, is that you know these new devices, be they mobile, be they you know cloud services, be they Internet of Things devices, connected coffee pot, connected lights. You know, I heard this thing um, in another keynote actually. So I guess I just steal my stuff from other people. But that you know, you never come back from a conference and talk about like. You know how good the lighting was, or whatever. Well, I do because I, you know, have to stare at it. Um, but you know, you probably as an attendee don't. But you do talk about like how good the the network connectivity was. Probably, you know, if you can't like get your your text messages or your emails, that you probably talk about. But in a few years, like the idea of network connectivity is not even going to exist. You know, like how your children don't know what cassette tapes are, and pretty soon aren't even going to know what a book is because it's all on the iPad. Like the idea of a device not being connected, like you know, as these lights burn out, they're going to get uh, replaced with like a Philips Hue light bulb. As you know, your car gets too old, you get one of these newfangled ones with all the the connections. So you know, in a few years, the idea of the internet isn't even going to exist anymore. It's just going to be the way things are. Everything is going to be connected. So it's just going to get worse, basically. Um, and the way these things communicate are just, there's just so many of them. I mean, even like powering the device, right? Um, you know, the, some of them are wireless now. But you know, I always hook mine into the laptop and just don't bother with the wall connection. And you know that's a really good way to pass malware from you know the phone to the computer or vice versa. There's actually been like air gapped networks, you know, that were so secure and so high risk that they had no internet connection that have actually been compromised back in the U.S. Um, by somebody plugging in you know their personal device to it to charge it. Um, certainly, the cables themselves can attack you. Um, you know, I see them at the airport, the like, power your stuff. And I'm like, wow, that would be a really great attack vector. But I just think that way, I guess. Um, near, near field communication for a lot of the payment, you know, scanning stuff. Um, we talked a little bit about Bluetooth. You know, there's been attacks over that. Um, I mean, any of these are also ways that people could be fished. Um, you know, they, they do speak Wi-Fi, certainly. They have cell towers that they talk to. Um, I can't, GPS. Um, you know, we've seen SIM card attacks. So there's basically the underlying message being there's all these other different ways that these things are communicating, 
but you know your traditional intrusion detection system. I mean, for years, you know, these reports would come out, the threat reports. Finally, you know, they're they're catching up about this. That obviously there are mobile threats, but for years and years, like the threat reports would come out, like the data breach reports and all that. And they would come out and they would say there are no threats about mobile because we have detected none of them. And it's like, well, are you looking? Well, no. Do you have any like snort signatures for you know some a, a malicious cell tower? Well, no. Well, no wonder you're not seeing them, right? So I mean, again, we're not. We don't really. There's some startups that are trying to do like intrusion detection for like mobile communication, but let me tell you from experience, startup life sucks, and you don't have the budget of uh, you know some of these these big players for advertising. So you know, good luck with adoption for that. And then it just gets worse because of the ecosystem. I mean, to go back to the cloud, I mean, for every person that brings in a device or every, say, Samsung TV that is in a conference room or every you know, connected coffee pot or Philips Hue light bulb or any you know, connected device that ends up in your enterprise or is in someone's home or is in a coffee shop that someone takes the laptop to that in some way becomes you know, a part of your problem they have all this other stuff that they come with, you know? And to make it even more complicated, they're often like traditional machines. They're just servers out there somewhere. <laughs> Hopefully just not in somebody's basement, but hey, it's startup life, right? Um, you know, they've got, you know, application servers, they've got update servers, they've got, you know, all the stuff that comes with this the back end architecture of you know the cell cellular network and then the networks you roam to. I mean these are just servers out there somewhere on the internet. What if they didn't update? What if they get hit by one of these malware attacks? What if somebody breaks into the update server of either your carrier, somebody in your enterprise's carrier, or you know, the device manufacturer? and then you know, pushes a malicious update to the device. The device will say yes, because it came from the actual real server. It has the keys on it. So it's absolutely, according to the device, a legitimate update. So now you've got malware on the device. And the user didn't do anything wrong. The user had updated the device as much as they possibly could. They were not fished. They had completely stayed within security policy. But you, as the security administrator, have absolutely no control over the update server of you know, whoever the carrier is around here. Um, so you know, you're relying entirely on somebody else's security team. And let's face it, if we've been on a security team, I mean, hopefully, you know, Eternal Blue and Eternal Romance got fixed. But, you know, we keep seeing these malware attacks, and they keep hitting them. So it's like, why would anybody have that port open on the internet anyway? is my question, but I digress. I digress. But the main point being that you know, you've got all this other stuff that comes with it. You, the device, you, know, you may be able to, as we'll see, get some control over it. But a lot of the stuff that comes with it that you'll never see, the infrastructure that comes with these devices, again, controlled by somebody else, somewhat problematic to us as security people who would like to be able to just control everything. You know, I kind of beat myself to the punch with this, with the phishing. But I will also say that I used to not take phishing very seriously. I used to kind of think that phishing was, again, remember, I'm from more like the DEF CON security world where, you know, one-upping each other is, is much more interesting than talking about your work. Oh, that was cold. Can we cut that out? I'm kidding. Um, anyway, I used to kind of think phishing was what people talked about if they couldn't do real security research, which I've realized, you know, as I've gotten more... So I felt like, I guess I was in a bubble, and then you know, as I got pushed out of the nest, if you will, and you know, did my own projects, and thus you know, had to take on customers, and you know, become more savvy, and, and learn more about business and whatnot, it's, it's the phishing that's getting them every single time. I mean, forget about your advanced persistent threat. And even that, I mean, even like your advanced persistent threats these days, like you know, a big one in the news around mobile that I think I was very happy to see it break because you know it made a lot of people actually wake up and realize, oh my God, the iPhone can actually get hacked. Um, but you know it was a while ago. Now it was a Trident attack. It was actually three exploits, thus Trident, you know the Trident sword thing. Um, and it, it was a state-sponsored attack. You know they were all zero days um, to get control of a particular you know person. He was a human rights activist in the UAE. 
Um, you know, this cost, it was state sponsored. It was, you know, more money than any of us will probably ever see. Um, but it, it began with actually a text message. You know, it was, you know, a string of, of very sophisticated exploits. But it started with, hey, click on this. And it didn't come in through email. So, you know, if people have been educated, which hopefully, you know, in all of our enterprises, we are doing regular phishing education, sending out phishing emails of our own, doing remediation training for people who do things like give up their credentials or install applications. But we're only doing it over email, and we're only doing it over traditional devices, um, unless you're me. But you know, this is not a sales pitch. Um, but anyway, um, so the very sophisticated state-sponsored attack actually started with a text message. But the reason we know about it, you know, it's kind of sad to think about that. You know, all the attacks really that we know about are the failures. You know, the ones who got caught, the actually successful really successful attacks we know nothing about, which is really kind of sad if you think about it. Um, but the reason that we know about like the Trident attack is because this individual had actually been targeted before several times successfully. Um, so his, his government actually sent him to state-sponsored security awareness training, like really intense stuff. So when this text message came in, he actually recognized it for what it was, that it was a potential attack, that it wasn't necessarily something he should click on. Um, but if any of you guys are you know, in charge of you know, user awareness, try and think about you know, what rates your hit ratios you're getting on email still. You know, we certainly haven't gotten email down to zero. Certainly, you know, if they're not getting any education about it, you know, text message. I think like these secure apps like WhatsApp and Signal and Telegram and things like that, you know, secure end-to-end -end encryption and all that almost makes the problem phishing worse because I think it takes it takes users down a little bit in terms of like, well, th they think the app is going to protect them so they don't have to think, you know, from a security perspective, which I totally get. Um, you know, that's you know why we use the apps because they're going to protect us. Um, but a link is a link. You click on it. You know, you do what it tells you to do. Um, whether it came from an email or WhatsApp or Signal or anything like that, um, it can still absolutely hurt you. And your users are not getting the security awareness training about it. Um, QR codes as well. Um, you guys like QR codes here, right? Well, you know, I did one. I can talk about this because it was a, a reference pilot. Um, so people that I did a reference pilot for with my phishing product for mobile, they are d in downtown DC and they shared a building with a restaurant. Like the restaurant was downstairs, you know, that they, they had some offices upstairs. Um, so one of the things we did with, you know, we did a variety of phishing attacks, um, but one of the things we did was we made a QR code that went to um, our application um, for the restaurant and, you know, made a little poster. We're not artists. It wasn't that sophisticated. Basically, it said, you know, scan the QR code, install the application, and you'll get like $5 off your next order at that restaurant. Naturally, a lot of them went there because it was convenient. We hung it up in their break room, and man, those people were downloading that app. And it looked a lot like the real app because it was the real app. I just, you know, ripped it apart, added some other stuff, stuck it back together. So it wasn't coming from the Apple App Store or the uh, Android App Store. You know, it was coming from a third party app store, but Amazon is a third-party app store, so if you think you're going to get people away from third-party app stores, forget about it. They love it. Um, but, you know, people, this is, again, just a link, and people are not being educated about that it has the same security implications as if they get an email, you know, from someone in Nigeria, you know. If, I always think if I could just find the one that's, like, legit, it might be worth it. You know, get the millions, get out. Think about all the startups I could invest in. And hey, I could like sponsor OWASP. So naturally, I think I've convinced you that we have a problem here. But I think you know there was also has been a lot of pushback of who cares? It's just somebody's phone. I don't really care if like my employees' personal pictures get stolen. Um, you know that's on them. But you know as these devices integrate more and more into the enterprise. You know, they're on the network. You know, the Samsung TV is on the same network as all the other systems. Well, hopefully they're, you know, gapped with VLANs. But let's be honest, most of our enterprises are not that sophisticated, um, at least in my experience. So, you know, your, your coffee pot is on the same network as your, uh, 
your workstations and your servers, and it's sad, I know. Um, same thing with your mobile devices. You know, they're either VPNing in. Um, they, you know, in, in a lot of enterprises are just getting on the network. You know, they, they put the, the username and password for the Wi-Fi on the whiteboard in the break room. I mean, let's be honest here. Secure, this is something I think we as security people have gotten stuck in this idea that security is important. Obviously, it's important to the people in this room, but it's not really important to you know, most people. You know, your average like small business maybe has an IT person who maybe read my book, you know, if I'm lucky. You know, they don't, they're not really taking security nearly as seriously as they should. And even if they do have a big security team, they're probably all just CISSPs, nothing against ISC squared, I am one. But I mean, they're maybe not you know, doing everything that they need to do. Or, to really make the enterprise secure. This is a hard thing, you know, it's not easy. Um, I can't read my own slides because I don't have my glasses on. But basically this slide is about why this risk is important. I mean, there are a lot of things that if someone has installed a malicious application per se, or, you know, they've gotten compromised uh, through, you know, a root exploit um, that came in through a text message. Um, you know, we can steal data off the device naturally. Um, you know, any like credentials out of the iOS keychain, you know, that's one of the examples I do with my product when I'm showing people that some of this stuff doesn't work so great. God, I need to talk faster according to this. Um, control the device, um, you know, I tell this joke in America and, you know, sometimes it gets me tomatoed, but, you know, I used to, it says like post on Twitter, you know, I used to think that like if someone took over your device and posted on Twitter, um, you know, something bad that that would like ruin your life and it would be bad for the company. But our president has proved that you can say anything on Twitter and it will be okay. So I, I take that one back. Posting on Twitter is fine. Um, it can certainly like record video or audio. Um, if you're in like a closed door meeting um, for, you know, some acquisition, you know, someday that will be me and you know, my company acquired for lots of money. Um, you know, if the Samsung TV in the background um, or somebody's mobile device in their pocket has been compromised and is recording it, you know, and it's going, you know, to somebody else who's like a competitor, that might be bad. Um, certainly privilege escalation, you know, this all start, maybe the application layer like that tried an attack actually used three exploits to get full control of the device. And my favorite is pivoting, um, you know, from one device to another, you know, I said these things either VPN in, just get on the network, maybe have access to just some servers through a management system, like ability to get email. Um, but anything they can talk to, you know, I've said they talk all these ways that are not wired or Wi-Fi, uh, but, you know, they also talk Wi-Fi. They do t speak TCP IP. So, you know, say you have internal assets in your enterprise that have default passwords, have, you know, missing patches for things like Eternal Blue or Eternal Romance then uh, you've got a compromised device in there, it can start attacking other devices. And this is where the perimeter has been shattered becomes such a disaster. Because we assume something gets attacked, in order for it to call back to its attacker, its command and control, it has to cross our perimeter where our intrusion detection and stuff will catch it, right? Well, if it's the mobile device that does the attack, so it sends the like shell back to the mobile device who sends it out the mobile modem, bypasses the entire perimeter. You never saw a thing. And that's kind of scary. So we got to do something about it. I think, you know, the business people realized they needed to do something about it a while ago. And I mean the business people, the vendors, because, you know, it was a way to make money. Like, you know, put mobile on the front of the, the word antivirus and you can sell more antiviruses because people have more stuff. Um, again, this is more of a, a what we're going to talk about slide. And, you know, I need to talk faster, as I say. I digress way too much, particularly when I'm tired. But anyway, so these are things we're going to talk about, about mitigations. So, you know, the, I guess the most traditional is have two phones. Um, so, you know, you used to see that a lot. In America, I hardly ever see it. The kinds of places that would do it now just don't allow phones at all, like the NSA. You know, I gave, went to give a talk at the NSA, and they're like, no phones. And I'm like, but I'm doing phone demonstrations. It was kind of, that was an interesting day. 
Um, but actually, the most interesting part was that I didn't have a Mac adapter, and it was so early that like Best Buy wasn't open. They don't have Mac adapters at, at the NSA either, apparently. Um, maybe they do now. This was a while ago. Um, dual pro, so not having two devices, you know, one for, I mean, corporate, one is expensive, you, there's, there's more devices now you have to pay for and you have to update. Now you do become the administrator of it, which is what we wanted, but that's a lot more work. Um, and then, you know, they have the personal device. Users also don't want to carry around two devices. Again, I hardly ever see it anymore. Um, so kind of the idea of dual profile devices, you know, that's what kind of Samsung Knox does. Um, you know, we're always seeing this, like, people come up with, I can do the secure Android that's got the super sandbox. You know, there's always, you know, uh, a lot of them have been called black phone, like Boeing did a black phone, and then there was, uh, you know, the other black phone from Silent Circle, which I guess they're still around. But, you know, the kind of the concept of a phone within a phone um, where you're, you're partitioned. So ideally, you would have, like, you know, completely different hardware. And that's been tried to be done a couple times where it's like a separate CPU, a separate memory, a separate everything. So if one side gets compromised, it's literally isolated. Um, you know, that's kind of what your like secure enclaves and things are trying to do as well. Um, they're not really. Um, but, uh, you know, traditionally, um, when you actually try and isolate it hardware wise, one, it's like this big, and two, it, it blows up, it's hot. Um, so uh, kind of the gold standard right now is application isolation. You know, you probably, you know, if you work in an enterprise, have something like this where it's like you have two versions of email. You have your personal one and then, you know, the one with the lock on it that is, you know, your, your work app. And that those live in their own special sandbox that is impenetrable and no one will ever be able to get in. And that data is secure no matter what happens to the underlying device, if the device is compromised, if people you know, get phished, if they have other malicious applications on it, if they run into you know, a Trident-like exploit, you know, the idea being that these, this application isolation will keep your corporate data safe. Yeah, I'm sure you're all with me on that, that that was ever gonna work. So mobile device management became a thing. And this is like, you know, was my first understanding of like business versus security. Like, you know, me, exploits are cool. You know, being on the stage and writing books and things like that, and like that was more interesting to me than making money for a long time. Like, obviously one needs to make money, but you know, if I had to choose, I guess, you know, between money and fame for a long time, it was like, absolutely do the fame. Um, but then, you know, as I started doing a startup and started learning about this stuff, and I guess got greedy, if you want to get down to it, because then I could sponsor her wasp. I could underwrite your whole conference if I sold my company for money. Come on. Um, but, you know, we used to have Blackberries. Black, everybody had a Blackberry, and everybody had a Blackberry Enterprise server or a Bez. And what the Bez did, it didn't really do anything around security. It was really just for provisioning. So, you know, everybody didn't have to walk into the IT department and manually have their device set up so it could access the network, so it could, you know, get email, so it could, you know, do the Blackberry things. Um, and then people started buying iPhones and then Androids and, you know, things like that. And people, I mean, BlackBerry is still around. They actually have a mobile device management system now. They bought uh, Good and it's now called UEM. Um, so they're actually in this business now. Um, but they're, you know, BlackBerry is still around. Um, but that's kind of, you know, a head tongue twister. Um, but uh, so there was this open need. There was a line item in the budget for a BlackBerry Bez. Line items and budgets are great because then there's budget for it. It's an easy sale. Just get some, you know, mediocre salespeople to say, this is the replacement for the BlackBerry Bez for your iPhones and Android, and it does security. And everybody went and bought one. You know, the people with the biggest marketing budgets were taking, you know, taking up all the places. Um, and, but it didn't really do much around security. It still did the provisioning, and it was typically bought by operations, not by security. And thus, you know, the people who are, who are doing the acquisition, as you know, a startup founder, I now know this, those are the people you cater to. So security was very much like an afterthought in the corner. Um, you know, things like remote wipe and force a passcode, which, you know, these days and for several years now, that's been um, built into the device anyway, so it didn't really buy you much. Um, so naturally, they rebranded themselves and gave themselves a new name, Enterprise Mobility Management, made themselves a suite of products because, again, you can sell more stuff that way. 
uh, and you know, added some more security features like you know, application, you have your own app store, you can do whitelisting and blacklisting, have your own sandbox, um, you know, it'll do VPN for you, um, it'll set up like secure SharePoint, you know, all, all the like myriad things that they could possibly sell you. And like I said, even BlackBerry has one now, they bought good. Um, so, you know, there's tons of players in this market. It really comes down to, you know, the sales but, or sales and marketing budget. Um, but, you know, a lot of people have these. But I'm really happy to say that people are finally starting to push back against these things. You know, a lot of the clients that I work with are people that are like, I spend all this money on this thing and it says, you know, on the back of the box, like it'll protect me from like jailbreaks and things like that. But I'm starting to think that might not actually be true. Can you actually steal my corporate data off of a device that's uh, protected by one of these? And I'm like, well, oddly enough, I have a product that will show you that yes, indeed I can. Um, but part of it, um, typically part of your enterprise mobility management, you can get all of these as standalone pieces, but naturally they want to sell you all the pieces in the platform. Uh, but the one, like the, I guess, gold standard right now, again, is that mobile application management, um, the idea that, you know, whatever happens to the rest of the device, whatever the user does, whatever, you know, gets attacked, that, you know, somehow magically the sandbox is going to be okay and we're not going to be able to break into it, you know, it's not going to be able to see, you know, if secure Linux, you know, gets bypassed on Android and you know, I can see everything, um, even dump memory or, you know, I jailbreak the iPhone, but don't install Cydia. I hate to break it to you, but most of your, like, jailbreak protection is actually looking for, like, the Cydia app or the SU app, which, if your users jailbreak their own devices, absolutely, that's what they'll install. If it's, a, like, a malicious attack, they don't need a third-party app store. They're going after your corporate data and leaving, um, so they will not install Cydia. I swear I'm going to get off the stage. I will. Um, so um, naturally, endpoint protection. You know, I talked about mobile antivirus. Um, this has kind of become a thing again. It's mobile threat defense. Um, you know, trying to do antivirus better um, than just waking up periodically and, and scanning itself. Um, so, you know, we're starting to see it like a resurgence in this, you know, trying to actually catch the jailbreaks and things like that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a nascent industry, um, so I'm certainly seeing it get better, but we need to do a lot more around the endpoint protection. So, you know, revisiting it all, all of this is really scary, mobile, IoT, the cloud as well. Um, it's super scary and, you know, you guys got to get people to build better stuff. Um, you know, I'm just into breaking it. So what's missing is, you know, we're not really doing risk management about, around it. And as I said, people occasionally are these days, um, you know, starting to push back and say, you know, just putting this preventative technology in place isn't necessarily fixing the problem. We absolutely need to be monitoring this stuff. You know, we've got all this stuff like SIMs and everything and endpoint protections to monitor like our Windows machines and our servers and things like that for security threats. Um, but, you know, in my penetration testing practice even, you know, even being like the mobile expert, you know, that nobody ever even like thinks there's no way we can pen test people's like personal devices. Yes, you can. You put it in your, your like end user license agreement. If you're going to get on my network, you're going to be subject to my security practices. Absolutely. And that's what we need to be doing. Um, and we need to be doing it like all the time because somebody's going to drop their phone in the toilet at this conference, I assure you, you know, drinking will happen at the party and then they're going to get a new one. And the threat model of that, that user has changed completely overnight. And then, you know, somebody's going to install another IOT device. Um, so, you know, it, we, we got to get on top of this. Um, it's basically the point, you know, I kind of do my like sales pitchy, not sales pitchy stuff here. Um, but I got to get off the stage anyway, um, and it kind of makes me feel gross to sales pitchy, not sales pitchy anyway. But if you're interested in learning more about the security of mobility and IoT in your enterprise, by all means, these are some ways to contact me. So I ate up all my question time. I apologize, um, but I'm around. Thank you guys so much for having me. This has been a pleasure.